And uh, so I'd like to convene this meeting of the Public Safety Committee. This is a regular meeting that we have been having with uh, the Chief of Police since, well, before the consolidation, actually, before the city um, had control of the police department. And it's an ongoing effort to have a communication between citizens, the committee, the board, and the police department. So with that, um, I'd ask the clerk to please call the roll, although I don't anticipate that we will have any votes on this. Alderman Bosley. Alderman Kennedy, Vice Chairman Schmid. Here. Alderman Boyd. Alderman French. Present. Alderman Vaccaro. Present. Alderman Arnowitz. Here. Alderman Hubbard. Present. Alderman Carter. Present. Alderman Ingracia. Chairwoman Young. Alderman Present. Alderman Ingracia and Alderman, uh, well, no, he's, he's here, so Alderman Gracia has to be excused. Duly noted. All right. Um, Chief, are you going to make the first part of this presentation, or Richard? Yes. Why don't you introduce yourself to us first, because this is your first time here. First time here. Um, <laughs> hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, for those that I have not had a chance to meet with one-on-one uh, and uh, have attended luncheons and functions together, uh, my name is Richard Gray and I am the Public Safety Director. Uh, I have attended uh, quite a few of your uh, board meetings on Fridays and I will continue to do that going forward. Um, what we would like to do is, prior to local control, one of the things that we did as the board uh, for the police department was to make sure we had a, w a monthly report. And so with that being said, um, we're gonna have uh, Chief Dotson come up and start a monthly report process here. Can, can I give you an idea of what our monthly report was like? And we'll start with that with Chief. Good morning. And we'll do a presentation that is not dissimilar from one that I've done for this uh, board previously. We look at crime um, on a monthly basis to compare it to previous years as well as a five-year trend. As, as you may know, crime doesn't go up in a straight line, it doesn't go down in a straight line, it kind of moves in a squiggly line. So we're always looking for ways to identify patterns, identify trends, to make sure that we're responding. You've heard me talk a lot about hotspot policing, that's our strategy, putting resources into the neighborhoods, into the areas that need it to address the crimes. And this is one of the tools that we use to help diagnose those crimes, to triage the situation, to put resources in. Today, because I, I wanted to make sure that we had a full report, I've also included um, the assistant chief, Al Atkins, who once we go through the crime presentation, the crime presentation, will talk a little bit about homicides and some of the victimology and suspectology that we've seen in the cases from 2013. I also have here, because the city is divided up into three commands for us, a South Patrol, a Central Patrol, and a North Patrol, the area majors for two of those areas that can talk about some of the challenges that they see in their neighborhoods and answer questions and the strategies that we have going forward. And then Maj Major Jerry Layshock, who commands our special operations, our mobile reserve unit, who has responsibility for the entire city. So what I tried to do was, was provide the, this board with the resources and a conversation about the issues that the officers see every day in the neighborhoods, the challenges that we face, and some of the strategies, including the partnerships with the community that we're looking for to help reduce crime in the city of St. Louis. So with that, we'll start with our, our crime presentation. If you notice, it says crimes coded through April 22nd. Normally, these are our month snapshots, but I wanted to give this board the, the closest snapshot that I could. So this includes some data of a partial month, partial month of April, and then some data that's only complete through March. It's just the way the statistics are, are compiled. And I'll tell you which of those slides are which as we go through it. But normally we would look for the, for the previous months. This one includes partial month of April, which obviously is still in process. So the first slide that we have and that we look at are the major crime categories in part one. Homicide is on the left, and as it's been no secret and reported in the news, the city of St. Louis has seen an increase in homicides this year. In comparison to last year, and this is through April 22nd of this year, we see a number that is an increase of 16. That's very concerning to me and very alarming, and we'll talk about some of the things that we are doing to address it, but homicide is probably, this, not probably, it is the single most difficult crime for us to impact. Just to give you an, an example, so we, we, you start to see some of the challenges that we face. On Easter Sunday, a young man murdered his mother in their home. Um, 
sequestered the body, hid the body in a, in a closet in a storage area, and we weren't aware of it until Tuesday when the family started to inquire. There is no intervention that law enforcement could have had that would have precluded that crime from happening in that home on Sunday. There are some issues with uh, how the gun was obtained that we can certainly talk about later, but that's outside the scope of, of law enforcement. Those are some of the challenges, and that's just the most recent to, to accentuate the point. As we move across the categories, uh, rape down uh, 10, 11 percent, robberies are down, aggravated assaults which are a precursor to homicides in a lot of cases. We've seen an increase in aggravated assaults. That number is not incidents, but it's victims. We've also seen a number, an increase in the number of multi-victim incidents, where individuals will fire into a vehicle and there are three or four or five people in that car and we have three or four or five victims. Aggravated assaults do not require an individual to be shot. Ind aggravated assaults can be simply the threat of violence, and so that number does not indicate that we have uh, 22 more people shot. We just have 22 more people that were put into harm's way. Moving across the categories, burglary has seen a decrease of, of 17 percent, almost 18. Larcenies are down almost 17 percent. Vehicle theft we've talked about early on in the year. At one point earlier in the year, we were plus 81 in vehicle theft. We saw a spike in vehicle theft uh, with the cold winter this year. People were warming up their cars, leaving the keys in the car. We saw an increase in what we call key steals. At one point in, in the year, this number was closer to 100. We're working to whittle that down. And arson is a very small category, and uh, we see only four increased there. The next slide talks about crime overall from the city. And the red bar is total crime. As of April 22nd, and this is through, this is the partial month, 11.6% uh, decrease, decrease in crimes. Translated, that's about 780 fewer victims. Property crime is the gold bar a decrease of 13.7 percent, almost 750 fewer victims. And in person crime, uh, the category that includes homicides, aggravated assaults, robberies, uh, rape, uh, we've seen a decrease of 2.8 percent or 36 fewer victims. The uh, next slide. And, and again, context is always important. And we didn't have this conversation at the end of December when the city saw a 50 percent decrease in crime. We didn't have this conversation when we saw additional decreases. Right now, compared to 2006, and I go back to 2006 because in the last 10 years, 2006 was the highest crime year. So going back to since 2004, 2006 was the highest crime year. We've seen a 56.9% decrease in person crime. Crime is personal and crime is about the individual. I understand that. But we have to always have these conversations in context. Fewer people are involved in person crime today than were involved in person crime in 2006. Property crime has seen a 55% decrease and total crime in the city of St. Louis since 2006, and this is for through March. So this is, this is the, one of those categories we do full, full months. Through March, crime in the city of St. Louis, total crime, person and property, is down 55.3% compared to 2006. When we look at crime, I talked about the, the three areas that the city are divided into, the North Patrol, South Patrol, and Central Patrol. We look at crime in those three categories, total crime, person crime, and property crime by area. As you can see, um, all the areas are down in total crime. North Patrol is leading the decrease in total crime by 15.3%. North Patrol is leading the decrease in uh, property crime, 18.8%. Uh, and then North Patrol has also seen a decrease in person crime of 2.8%. Uh, as we move to Central Patrol, 9.7% uh, decrease in total crime. Property crime in the Central Patrol and the Central Corridor down 126 and a slight uptick in crime through that category uh, in person crime of 1.8%. So the Central Corridor has seen an increase of eight crimes compared to the same period for last year. South Patrol, all three categories are down, 9.2% in total crime, 9% in property crime, and 103 in person crime. So our enforcement area our strategies throughout the city are having an impact on crime in the areas that we can. This is look, breaking down, specifically looking at homicides. Districts one and two are in blue. Districts three and four are the gold bar. Districts five and six are the red bar. As you can see, we have this year, 2014, through April 22, 27 of the murders have happened in either districts five or six. 12 of the murders in districts three and four, and five of the murders in the first and second district. 
This is a slide that's through March because we look at full data. This is a five-year comparison of homicides. Uh, the blue line represents the five-year average. The greenish line is um, this trailing 12 months. For March, we saw six more homicides than the five-year average. And you can see homicides, as I've already said, are, are very difficult to intervene in. We see that this line moves up and down across the five-year average. Sometimes it's below it, sometimes it's above it, sometimes it touches it. But again, it's a diagnostic to look back and say, where is the city of St. Louis? Where is the Metropolitan Police Department? Where is crime in the city of St. Louis compared to our five-year average? The next slide talks about robberies. And again, these are through March. 38 fewer robberies in the city of St. Louis than the five-year average. Uh, as you can see, we've continually for the last 12 months stayed below the five-year average on robberies. The same uh, aggravated assaults, 55 fewer aggravated assaults. Again, precursor to homicides, very concerning to us. Typically, we stay below. We saw a spike at the end of last summer. We addressed it, and now we've continued to stay below the five-year average. Citywide burglaries, uh, 178 fewer in March than the five-year average. Larcenies, which is the, the largest single category that the Metropolitan Part Police Department deals with, almost 300 fewer larcenies than the five-year average. And vehicle thefts, we talked about the, the increase in January and February during the colder months, but in March we've returned to that separation between uh, the five-year average and what happens in the city. There were 70 fewer stolen autos in March than the five-year average. Uh, we're always interested in Forest Park because, the, as the news media always likes to talk about, uh, Forest Park. This is a, a slide that simply shows the crime in Forest Park through March. 26 incidents. You'll see no person crime. Those 26 incidents were predominantly larcenies from vehicles. And that really concludes the crime portion of the presentation. I would ask the Assistant Chief Al Atkins to come up, talk about homicides. Uh, we'll do a little bit more of dialogue and conversation, then we'll be happy to answer your questions. Good morning. Uh, as the Chief said, Alfred Atkins is my name. Uh, I'm currently over the Bureau of Investigation and Support, and one of the units under that is the Homicide Division. Uh, Keith's going to run through a few slides here, but uh, let me start off by saying uh, what is going to be painted is a dim picture. It's a very dim picture, especially being African American, because what you're going to see is the majority of the victims and the suspects are black, and, and it, I mean, it's no secret. You're going to see that the majority of the crimes are occurring in the North Patrol Division, uh, which is now the 5th and the 6th District, but formerly the 6th, 7th, and the 8th District, uh, with the inclusion of some of the incidents in the 5th District. Uh, what you're going to see is poor education, you're going to see poor family structure, you're going to see in and out of the penitentiary, and one of the most alarming things you're going to see um, in this, in this uh, presentation is the presence of uh, narcotics and alcohol in, in the victims. Uh, what I did, I took a look at the five-year because, as the chief said, you can't just, you can't just take a, a, a glimpse at it. You just can't have a snapshot of what you're looking at. You have to go back historically and look at what's going on. So five years is one of the best uh, windows to take a look at. I took 2013 uh, for this presentation. We don't have complete information for 2014, but I'm, I'm sure you all know Lieutenant John Green. You've probably seen him on TV. John. He is the commander of the Homicide Division, and if you have any questions specifically about 2014, John is here to be able to answer those. Hopefully I'll be able to answer uh, anything before that. But 2013 is the window I took a look at. Historically looking back, uh, St. Louis uh, has been a violent town. There, there's no secret there. What you see in red there, um, in the, the early 70s, the late 70s and the early 90s were Ooh, extremely violent I years in the city of St. Louis. Now this goes back to 1920, okay? The early 90s, once again. Now, what was happening during those times, of course, we know that crack cocaine came upon the scene, heroin came upon the scene. But what we found is that it's not necessarily the <coughs> drugs, it's not the robberies, it's not the burglaries. It's failure to be able to communicate with each other. Uh, it's arguments that lead to most of these murders. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just another graph to show, and this is up to 2010, how it spikes. It'll go up and down. So predicting homicide, let alone, let alone being able to stop homicides, is, is a ridiculous thought. What we really need to put our efforts into is, is to be able to um, get the people that are doing the homicides and put them in a penitentiary where they belong. Next slide. 
this is a this is a comparison of uh, five years as opposed to last year. The, now the anomaly last year was January and December. Uh, I can't explain this to you. I don't know why. But for the five year average, we were below um, um, last year in 2013 for 90 95 percent of the year. Next slide. This is a district of occurrence. Now this is on the old scale, and as you can see, as I said earlier. District six, seven, and eight, uh, and the fifth district uh, historically have led in murders in the city of St. Louis, and that's the northern quarter of the city. Next slide, uh, and this is the breakdown. As what we've done is the homicide division transposed to the new uh, six district configuration, and this shows you a look at, at how we are with 120 last year, uh, and how they break down as as opposed to different districts. Uh, the five-year monthly average. Uh, we found that June and October historically are, are the, the hottest months, okay, and, and that's for murders. Now, you would, you would think, okay, if you want to correlate that to anything, you might think, okay, well, it's probably. Excuse me. Can you speak up because it's hard for the people on that end of the room to hear? Oh, okay. Maybe it's the microphone. Big, deep voice. Yeah. You can broadcast. I, I'll lean into it. Um, you can see in June and in October, now you would think that that would relate to kids uh, getting out of school and getting back to school and forming those different relationships. But I'm here to tell you that's not the problem, okay? Uh, and and it, it's, uh, it'll be clear a little bit later. Go ahead to the next one. And, and here's where the picture starts to become a lot clearer. What we've seen typically, and this is just 2013, but what we've seen typically is the ones that are, that are doing the murders, the ones that are being murdered are in the age range of 20 to 29 years old. They're out of high school, okay? These are adults. The next category is 30 to 39, um, and 40 to 49, 50 to 59. The juveniles, the quote unquote juveniles, don't come in until number six, okay? You got the 17 to 19 year olds that follow after that, and 60 plus, thank God, where I'm really close to, uh, doesn't even come into the picture at all. Uh, so. We want to say that the children are the problem, and the, the information, the statistics just don't show that. Next one. We started taking a look at a couple of years ago uh, who was being murdered in the city, and the actual suspects, to a large degree, mirror a lot of this information. The unfortunate thing is uh, a lot of cases are not cleared. People do not want to come forward and say who did what. Uh, so we, we can go as far as we can with a case. We never give up on a murder, but city residents that were murdered last year, there were 84 of them. Nine residents are 36, and this, to the cases that we have cleared, if you look at the suspects, the suspects are not city residents. So what you have is people that are coming into the city of St. Louis for whatever reason, and they're either killing people or they're being murdered in the city of St. Louis. Uh, the criminal history, I don't know if you can see it at the bottom, the majority of the victims have criminal past, that mean, and I'm talking about felonies that they have been to the penitentiary for or they have been arrested for. That's the picture goes on here, and if you can see right there, high school attended. Of the victims last year uh, that we could get information on, now this information is coming from family, okay? So 60 of the victims, half of the victims last year had some high school. Now that's anywhere from the first day to the day that they did not graduate. So college attended, we have two. Um, some college, there are three. Next slide. Um, and, and here's where it really gets bad. 115 of the victims last year out of the 120 had some sort of illegal narcotic or alcohol in their system. Okay, hey, it impairs judgment. Some of them, and, the, and if you add the numbers up, it's more than that, but some of them had uh, either alcohol and cocaine, they had heroin and cocaine, they had marijuana and cocaine, marijuana and alcohol. So some of, the majority of the victims last year, 96% of the victims had some type of uh, either illegal narcotic or uh, alcohol in their system. Of the, of the wanted subjects, or arrested subjects last year, you can see once again that the age range from 20 to 39 are the largest ones, with 20 to 29 um, being the largest ones. Again, the juveniles or the, those that are 17 to 19 years of age comes in fifth or sixth in this. We know that 
there's no reason for you to kill me if you don't know me, if you don't have a beef with me. So this is no surprise to us that um, individuals who are murdered or are murdering someone have some sort of relationship with them. So we know that on those that we have cleared, 41 of the people that were murdered or murdered someone last year had some type of relationship with the victim. Um, Ex-boyfriend, girlfriend, boyfriend, girlfriend. Um, there are those domestic incidents that are extremely hard to, uh, to understand, predict. Um, and the stranger, the stranger is, is really one that we're really trying to wrap our head around. Because if you, if you do not have a, a reason to, unless it's blatantly a street robbery and something goes wrong in the robbery or a burglary, something goes wrong in the burglary, then, uh, then that stranger category, uh, I feel, should be a lot, a lot smaller. Next slide. Suspect information, once again, this, this mirrors the, the, uh, the victimology. Uh, we get this information a lot from witnesses. In the criminal history, those are cases that where arrests have been made or one has been placed, and we see that there is some type of criminal past here. So if you, if you look at it, it's, it's pretty much the same. The suspect and the victim, um, they could be twins, quite honestly. Next. 56 of the cases that were closed last year, and here we are with the, uh, the information again. Uh, 36 of those were city residents, and non-residents were 21. And these, that's the suspect. Uh, this information, once again, is no surprise. The 9 millimeter is the weapon of choice for whatever reason, but it's, it's quickly being followed by the 40 caliber. So high capacity weapons are, are a real problem. Uh, and here are the motives. Uh, and you can see argument or drugs, but what, if you look at each one of these, drugs, fight, argument, unintended, and these are UCR categories that we have to put these things into for the FBI, but what it comes down to is, is basically uh, communication. Uh, the majority of these things, uh, be it retaliation, uh, be, it, uh, be it an argument, be it a fight, these individuals, the victim and the suspects, cannot work out their differences, and it ends in the, the death of, of one of them. Uh, and these are the neighborhoods that occurred, that um, the murders occurred, and I, and I realize, that's, realize that's kind of small, but it's the same information as the district, whatever district you lived in, or you live in, or you represent, then the, the, um, the neighborhood is within that. And the last slide um, um, paints the picture of what we're talking about here. Um, you're talking about black males in the age of 20 to 39 or the highest category. Uh, formal education is not there. Uh, you, as you saw with the victims, the, the tox is high, so we are pretty sure, we can't get that information from the suspects, but we're pretty sure that, that drugs or alcohol played some part in it. Uh, they have uh, some relationship with the victim. Um, criminal past is indicated, uh, we know that both from the suspect and from the victims, uh, the northern quarter of the city, there's the ease of access to firearms. Um, and we, we really need to wrap our head around that. I was watching the news yesterday where Georgia, I believe it is, they just passed laws where they can carry the weapons into schools, into churches, into gambling houses, uh, into bars. So we, we really need to, to head that off. And um, the suspects we know could be the twin of the uh, of the victim in, in a large majority of the cases. So, um, if you have any specific questions now, I'll, I'll try to answer them. Um, or if you have something about 2014 you're interested in, um, we can try to answer that. But if it's all right, two things. One, we'll make copies of my PowerPoint available to the committee as well as as Colonel Atkins. I'd also probably at this point like to bring up the area majors so you can hear directly from the people. So we'll start with Major Ronnie Robinson, who is the commander of North Patrol. He'll be followed by Major Joe Spees, the commander of South Patrol, and then by Jerry Layshock. So Ronnie, if you want to start. Good morning. Good morning. Major Ronnie Robinson, commander of North Patrol in the city of St. Louis. <clears throat> as, you, as was displayed before, on the screen, right now the concern as far as North Patrol is concerned is person crime and violent crime. This issue, uh, the situation that we're in today and what I'm seeing today personally, and I've talked to and I've had conversations with the chief about it, how did we get to this point right here? Historically, before the chief became, became chief, there was a lot of intervention, 
and proactive policing going on in the city. When we decided to go with decentralization, it was good for, this, for the police department in the city in certain areas, but when it came to person crime, decentralization hurt us relative to what we were doing as far as being proactive in the schools and the kids and identifying individuals at an early age to try to prevent them from being involved in criminal activities and becoming career criminals. Right now we're behind. We're trying to catch up. It's no secret that we got a violent problem in our city. One of the first things the chief did when he became chief was centralize the gang unit again to try to catch up with the identification of individuals that are roaming around the city with no good intent but to harm people and to take away from good people that are trying to survive in our cities, in our city. With, with centralization of the gang unit, what that does is that puts us back in the schools and this puts us back in the community to intervene and do outreach along with enforcement, gather intelligence along with enforcement to try to stop the violence. And we're moving forward and we're having some successes doing that. The chief just allowed me to create a violence response squad in North St. Louis where I have officers that respond to every aggravated assault, every shooting, every homicide for immediate intervention with the victim, the victim's family, the suspect, and the suspect's family, and the associates of both the victims and the suspects. That intervention needs to be done to let them know that if there's a possibility of retaliation, we want to know exactly where it's coming from, who is possibly is going to do the retaliatory shootings, and that we are in the mix of what the problem is and identifying exactly what the problem is and letting you know that we know exactly where you live, exactly where you travel, who you're associating with, and we can talk the talk and walk the walk the same walk that you guys are doing on the street. So we will not tolerate violence. We, we have no zero tolerance relative to violence. We will not accept it. And if you want attention from us on a daily basis, go out here and start shooting up the community, and that's exactly what you're going to get. So they're responding to every shooting. They're making an assessment to see whether if it's gang related, if it's personal, to find out exactly what the shooting is all about. Also, at the same point, we're doing outreach to the families that are involved and affected by this. Right now, we've had two nights, two events at the Demetrius Johnson Foundation where we've had the families of victims, unfortunately, have lost a loved one to respond to the foundation and get free professional counseling because this is not only a crime issue, it's a health issue also. And if you go out here and you talk to people and you talk to these kids and you get in these schools, you'll find out the pressure and how they're living and what they're walking in every day. The only way you're going to find out is if you go in there and communicate with them. We're good at locking people up. We, got, we lock up an average 30,000 people a year. We have no problem with that. But what we need to constantly do is get to know the people, intervention, outreach, and proactive policing. And that's what we're getting back to. And like I said, we're catching up. This summer is going to be very challenging for us. We recognize it, and we're putting things in place to try to combat it and to deter the violence. The outreach part of it, we got the families responding to get free counseling relative to the loss of their loved one. We're also handling cold, ca cold cases as far as updating the families and try to solve these cold cases. The homicide division and the commanders are responding to the events and the families get to sit down and talk one-on-one -on -one with the detectives that have the case and that are investigating the case. It's been a tremendous, tremendous opportunity to also build the relationship with the community where we need to get that trust back and let them know that we're just not here to lock people up or have negative confrontations or encounters at the beginning when we first run into a citizen or have an encounter with a citizen. We want them to know that we care, and we do. We care. 
Because if we didn't, we wouldn't be reaching out. We're reaching out. We're using the radio, Hot 104.1, to reach out to the younger individuals that live in our community and let them know that we need their help. We need them to stop and hesitate before they act out violently to solve a problem. We've got events coming up this summer with the radio station in the parks, Better Family Life. We reached out to them. We've got events coming up with Better Family Life. And as I mentioned before, we're doing a collaboration with Demetrius Johnson Foundation, Katim Wahid, and Joe Yancey of the Peoples and Places for, for professional counseling. So we're trying to do things, not just enforcement, but proactive police and also for prevention as far as this violence is concerned. And I think we're going to make some headway. With the chief allowing us to have this violence response team up in North, in North St. Louis, we're already seeing and working closely with the Homicide Division, Special Operations, and the Intelligence Division, we've already seen some successes as far as stopping retaliatory shootings. So if this continues, and as we continue to work towards intervening, I think we're going to be very successful in the future. Violent crime is a priority in North St. Louis. You know it's a very dynamic area as far as our city is concerned. We've got a multitude of issues. We've got cruising issues. We've got the parks that are volatile. And I had a 14-year-old kid come in my office that I sat down to talk with for over an hour relative to the fight groups that are being organized on social media mm -hmm. where these kids are getting together as a sport, as a sport to be involved in criminal activity, where they mob, they become mobs, actually. And they can respond to an area through a text or, or do Twitter, Facebook, in the hundreds and commit havoc on the community. We're in the midst of that now. We've got this kid to tell us how they do it, why they do it, and when they're doing it. He's one of the organizers, and he's working with us. And we've been able to quell some of that activity already. So we're doing it. We're, we're in there. We're pushing. We're fighting. But we also have to let these kids know that we care at the same time. These are kids. But with three decades of the crack cocaine infestation, the drug infestation in the community, and the streets raising these kids, what do we do to supplement being a parent? What we do we do to supplement giving kids the foundation that they need to respect the value of life? How do we do that as police officers? We can't do it alone. We're sending that message to the community that we need their help. Let us know any time that they see something that's not familiar to them in that community, down now we run. That's our message. So we got to struggle. And we know it. The chief has put the, the juvenile division back in the schools. Gang unit, gang unit detectives are going back into the schools to gather intelligence, to stop a conflict that starts in a school, in a high school, that ends up out in the community, and the results is an 11 year old boy being shot and killed in front of a computer while he's doing his homework. How do you stop that? We got our hands full, we know it, we're working hard to solve it, and we will continue to address it. And we need all the help we can get. Any questions? Thank you, Major. Major Spees. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joe Spees. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm the commander of the South Patrol Division. Uh, I can give you a little perspective this morning because I've been a captain in both South St. Louis and North St. Louis. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I think there's a perspective sometimes that the police department polices differ differently in the city, and I can assure you that that's not the case. What happens is, is that the chief of police directs us and assigns us to an area, and we look at that area, pick out the challenges, and then we try our best to address what we're throwing, what's thrown in front of us. You just heard Ronnie Robinson as commander of North St. Louis and, uh, and even spilling into the central corridor of the city addressing violent crime issues. Uh, it's vital that the police department recognizes and, and tries its best with the city to make that better. 
my current challenge in South St. Louis is a little different than that. Yes, we do have some uh, violent crime issues in South St. Louis. We do have uh, aggravated assaults with a firearm. But the majority of the crime that we address and we try to make a difference in is property crime in South St. Louis. And just to give you some perspective on that, the first district, while down 5.8% in 2014, currently uh, burglaries and um, car break-ins and vehicle thefts are really a big challenge for us. And as the chief told you earlier, vehicle theft is uh, decreasing, in, especially in South St. Louis. Uh, I'm blessed with two good captains, and Captain Howard in District 1 has really uh, had an impact on our burglaries in uh, District 1. Down about 25% this year, uh, which is a significant move anytime you're looking at crime numbers. Uh, vehicle theft is up 20% currently, but Jerry Layshock is about to come up here from Special Operations and tell you how our anti-crime car theft team is doing and what their work is and how they're making that number better. One of the, the uh, significant crime issues that we deal with in District 1 is the Dutchtown neighborhood. Uh, as a captain in the 1st District for three years, I can tell you that Dutchtown's numbers were significantly high and that's a focus for any District 1 captain and Captain Howard now is dealing with half of Dutchtown because of redistricting. As you look toward District 2, Captain Swiderski is doing a great job in, in that district, uh, but we have inherited Tower Grove South as one of the neighborhoods. And just to give you a little perspective on Tower Grove South, uh, we just recently finished up a hotspot initiative in that area, but they've had 217 Part 1 crimes just in that neighborhood this year alone. So as the chief challenges the majors and captains in South St. Louis to address crime, that's the style that we're looking at. What's going on in Tower Grove South? How does it affect the neighborhoods that are close to it? And what can we do about that? Some of the uh, significant decreases in, in the second district are also amongst theft and burglary, both down over about 15% for the year. But vehicle theft in District 2 is also a challenge, up about 6%. Some of the other issues that we police in South St. Louis, of course, we have Forest Park now in District 2. And Chief Dotson's recognized that as the jewel of the city in terms of parks and, and visitors to our city, uh, we're gonna do our best starting May 12th to keep that as safe as possible with a detail in, in Forest Park. So we're working hard in South St. Louis. Uh, yes, the challenges are a little different, perhaps significantly different than North St. Louis, but what we're tasked with, we're working hard at, and there's uh, two good captains that are really directing our officers uh, who are working hard to make it safer and get our property crime down. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Major, Major Layshock. Morning, everyone. My name is Jerry Layshock. I'm in charge of the uh, Special Operations Unit for the City of St. Louis. I have uh, teams of detectives, and although we do some prostitution enforcement and some narcotics enforcement, our, our, I would tell you our primary goal is to impact violence in the city, and we do that by targeting uh, identified deadly and dangerous felons. Although we have uh, a really crack squad of detectives who um, chart stolen cars, where they're recovered, ride those corridors, and work on identifying chronic offenders, people we've caught in stolen cars before because we know if they're riding around in a stolen car, they're also trying to break into cars, and often they're armed. We spend a lot of time, and it's our primary focus, in identifying deadly and dangerous felons, doing surveillance on them, and then trying to apprehend them. Uh, we have a great relationship with ATF and DEA and the FBI. We have uh, officers that are assigned to me that are detached to these federal agencies. We work well with them. We just left Comstat a little while ago and heard about two great federal prosecutions of two separate young men that were caught with guns, but we were able to get them uh, federal sentences, which as you know is a little bit stiffer and they'll spend more time in prison. Uh, I would tell you since uh, January, the St. Louis Police Department has worked on what I think in my career is one of the most comprehensive gang strategies, anti-violence strategies I've ever seen. Special Ops is a big part of that. Every Thursday morning, there are police officers from every district that meet without any supervisors, there's a coordinator, 
and they discuss people in the districts who they're most concerned about for violence. Special operations, then those names are funneled to us and then we begin targeting them. We also uh, look at penitentiary releases. We spend a lot of time taking a look at victims of shootings because we're often worried that they're gonna come back for retaliation so they'll be arming themselves. And I guess the last thing I would say is, in a way, special ops is kind of the chief's hammer. When we have an outbreak of violence or street robberies, a pattern becomes evident. That's when special ops permeates that area. Uh, we flood that area and uh, we have specific goals when we do that. But again, I, I'd say the central theme is we're looking for violent offenders at all times. Thank you. wrap up and then, and then we'll take questions. You heard from the people that are most directly responsible today for the challenges that the city face. In the room today, and I didn't add it up, but there's probably close to 500 years of law enforcement experience in the room today, and you heard from about 200 years of those experiences. We are very focused on violence. We're very focused on crime. We just completed our first strategic planning session in probably the last three years, four years, and we spent a day and a half talking about what we can do in the crime area to reduce crime to make the city safer. There are a couple of things that I just have to mention before we take questions. There's a piece of legislation moving through Jefferson City, a Nullification Act. Jerry Leshock just talked about some of our partnerships with our federal agencies. That legislation would make it illegal, hold police officers civilly liable for participating in federal investigations. Just to give you an example, if there's a bank robbery, and we participate in that and make an arrest and hand it over to the FBI, that police officer could be civilly liable. It's nonsense, it's ludicrous, and it would hurt the city of St. Louis. We have to make sure that that legislation doesn't pass. If it does pass, the governor will veto it, but as you know, last year a very similar bill came very close to having the governor's veto overridden. I'm not sure it has the support not to override the veto this year. The second one is, and you've heard us talk about it completely, or, or continually, the circuit court in the city of St. Louis has to do a better job when we arrest individuals for violent crime. We ask for an armed offender docket and the city courts responded with something, and I've said it before, that is nothing more than window dressing. The circuit court last week put out a press release that talked about their activities. What was missing from that press release? Outcomes. They talked about the expediency at which they handled cases, but they talked about nothing about outcomes that keep the community safer. A couple of, of the presenter, presenters alluded to it. Victims in homicides, suspects in homicides, people that we encounter on a regular basis are no strangers to the criminal justice system. Yet they're still allowed to walk the streets, they have guns, and in many cases they've been convicted, but the conviction is an SIS, which is not a conviction, and we cannot arrest those individuals and take that case federally, and you just heard that we get better outcomes in federal court than we do in state court right now. We have to be serious. We arrest between 27 and 30,000 people a year. Incarceration isn't the answer all the time, but what happens is we don't get outcomes that make people safe. We don't get outcomes that change those individuals' lives. So if we arrest a, a young man, a young woman with a firearm, they get sentenced to probation, they come out back into society in exactly the same place they are, the recidivism rate, the repeat rate at which people reoffend in the city of St. Louis is as high as 70% in some cases. Incarceration may not be the answer, but what we're doing is just a revolving door right now. So thank you. Okay. Um, so if I'm listening to this, am I assuming then that Major Leshock's officers would be involved in the policing that you're doing in north side and south side, or is that being handled by the captains in the districts? Well, let's talk about redistricting, and I've talked about redistricting. Each captain now has a group of officers that they can do hotspot policing within their individual areas. Major Leshock's group, which includes special operations and mobile reserve, come in and supplement those officers. So Major Leshock's officers work in each of the six districts, and they really go to the areas that are seeing the biggest increases, the biggest spikes. I would just, uh, as a, a rapid deployment force, a ready force that you can deploy as quickly as you see a pattern or a trend develop, they go into those neighborhoods and areas throughout the entire city. Okay. Um, we'll proceed then with questions from the Alderman. Alderman Bosley, do you have questions of the Chief? All kinds of them. Well, let's get some out here. 
Well, how about we'll give uh, each alderman five minutes for questions, and then we'll move on to the other, and we'll come back so everybody has an opportunity to ask. Uh, I'll just read off some of these things that I've written down mm -hmm. because I've been down here for perhaps longer than almost anybody else, and I have a very close relationship with the people in my community. But uh, let me just say, there are some things that the alderman hears, sees, and becomes aware of that he just doesn't want to talk to anybody else. I've called your office so many times to give you some very specific things that were going on. I never get you on the phone. I don't call you to waste your time. There are things that I hear that people will bring to me and will not tell the police and would not perhaps tell anybody else because they're afraid that if their name gets involved in it. And then there are times when people have called the police and the police come to their house and say, you call, where is that problem you were talking about? Who was it selling drugs? The police will come to those doors and knock on that door and say, look, Joe Blow told me that you were doing A, B, C, and D. Now that has happened before and we got to stop that. You know, once in a while, the police in my neighborhood attend the neighborhood meetings. But since they've redistricted, I'm the only one. I don't have a clue where my fifth ward ends, where it begins, and where the fourth ward comes in, and where the police areas are in my ward. I don't know. And when you call down there, sometimes they treat you like you stole something. You need to talk to those people on that, uh, um, uh, uh, they talk to the people that answer that phone. Now, I got over 100 block captains in the third ward that call me and tell me all kind of stuff. I try, and I'm not going to call 911 and say, Joe over at 3921 is selling drugs. I don't know that for a fact. But what I'll do, I'll call somebody who is in that fifth district or fourth district, and I don't even know which fourth district uh, what what it takes up in the third ward, nor the fifth ward anymore, because they never said to me like they used to say, and I guess they did that with other aldermen, I hope they did, say, look, here's what you can do, here's what you call when you have something that you think we really need to know about, and here's who you talk to. I don't know anymore. And when you call 911, by God, they give you such a runaround uh, down there. And I got a few things here. Uh, okay. And then you don't know the block captains. Before you came chief, I have a hundred block captains in the third ward that I shared with um, Captain Ison. And I don't know what he gave that to you or not, but then the wards have changed. And some of the stuff that was in my ward and some of the block cabins that I had are now in the 19th ward, some are in the 6th ward, some of them are over there in the 21st ward. And, uh, 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 and then when you call 911, and I've been a victim of that, I call 911, they treat me like I stole something on the phone. And then to get hold of you, by God, it's like pulling eye teeth sometimes, because there's some things that I want to tell you that I would not want to tell to somebody else, because I know you're not going to go and say, Freeman Bosley said A, B, C, and D, and I'm not going to call you unless I know specifically what is going on. You don't know the block captains. I used to give the police in my area a list of who they were. These are people that are so nosy, they'd be looking out the window all day and half the night, and they see what's going on. They know more than I do and know more than the police do because they will see it usually before the police see it. Now, if we were able to somehow work that out where you would know who they are and they would feel comfortable calling you, that would make a big difference because you only get to call after uh, the thing has happened, and it has happened pretty big. 
So also at the Urban League, if you don't want to get my block captains, the Urban League will have a list of block captains that you can call. And those block captains, once you make some kind of relationship with them, you'd be surprised that Miss Jones, who peeps out the second floor window all the time, she knows more about what's going on in the neighborhood than the police do. And I do. But they will only call when it's something bothering them. So, uh, listen, there's absolutely no way I would be wanting to do without the police. But there's some input in some of these things that I gave to you uh, may help. And I don't know whether you consider, around, consider well, that or not. Absolutely. And if I can just, um, you represent the area around Crown Candy, kind of the near north side, right? Is that? I've been to several meetings in there, and we must have missed each other. I must have left before you got there. The other thing is that we'd be happy to take the initiative to put you in a police car with us to drive around and look at the boundaries of the ward. And I think you know Lori Wozniak, was she uh, the liaison officer into your neighborhoods? Uh, we have a liaison officer into your neighborhoods as well, so we do have it. I am a firm believer in the neighborhood ownership model, and as these 100 rock captains that you have organize, we'd be happy to work with them to do neighborhood watch, court watch programs, a variety of things that I've talked about throughout the city. So certainly, and, and I think you do have my cell phone number, and so you, I think you can get a hold of me a little bit easier than you probably portrayed it out to be. Thank you, Alderman Bosley. Your five minutes is up. We'll come back to you again if you have further questions. Alderman Kennedy. Thank you, Ma Madam Chairman. Uh, could you talk about what are the types of things and mechanisms or projects or programs that could take place on the front end to help curb or prevent crime from happening? Because it, it appears much of your work is really on the back end from what I can tell, responding to things. So what are those things can be done on the front end? And that's a great question. The, fir the first one I talked about a little bit is a court system that really has outcomes that keep people safe. And again, I'm not saying that incarceration is their only option, but with recidivism rate as high as 70%, you see that we arrest the same people over and over. Of that 27 and 30 to 30,000 people, if we could reduce that number, that would give us more time to go out and do that. I think we need a generational solution. I think we need a solution that is targeting, and, and Ronnie talked about it a little bit, we're targeting in the schools. Right now in the high schools, we're really a maintenance program, trying to keep calm and keep that. I will tell you, I have gone to schools in various areas and see first and second and third graders that we can identify that don't have communication skills. Uh, I think we talked about communication skills, Al Atkins did, is key. Conflict resolution skills, the ability to, uh, to manage one's anger, those are all things that are Im important and we need to develop programs that do that. I think the recreation centers in Carondelet Park and O'Fallon Park are great starts, but they're splash in the bucket. We need those type of front-ended programs that are at the elementary school level because what we're seeing right now is 13, 14, 15 year olds in stolen cars armed with guns. There's very little that the juvenile justice system does in an intervention way. Just to give you an example, we, we all heard the story about the mayor uh, interrupting the knockout gang on, on Grand Avenue. I don't know if it's followed up that one of the young men that was involved in that case fell through the ju juvenile justice system for whatever reason and was killed committing a burglary less than a year later. Those are the things that we have to stop. We have to have a juvenile system that engages and generational change that's in the schools. Okay, when you say generational changes, explain that a little bit. Okay. Really what I'm talking about is an education system, and, and Al Atkins talked about it in his presentation, that uh, we get people through high school at least. We give them jobs, and really as part of that, we do a basketball program, where as part of the basketball program is if you want to play basketball, you have to participate in life skills, how to complete a job application, how to dress for an interview, how to interview, mm -hmm. how to complete your GED. Those are the types of programs that's really, and, and, and I'm stealing a phrase from Tim Fitch, that's mission creep for the police department, but as a society and a community, we really need to get into those root causes. Communication and conflict resolution are probably the two biggest ones that we're seeing teenagers and young adults are missing out on. We see each other from time to time. I saw you yesterday, actually, at a great um, celebration, celebrating uh, some officers who were doing great things uh, of particular uh, merit. Um, and most of the things that are being done, obviously, we don't hear about. But So I'll talk about some of the things that we probably already talked about to some extent. But I did want to point out that you know there are neighborhoods and there are some judges who are working together with the circuit attorney's office and the police officers 
Um, just recently, a um, young man, unfortunately, we didn't get to him soon enough, um, but for his first armed robbery, he got 18 years. Um, mostly because of where it happened, how it happened, and the neighborhood coming together and the, and the judge listening to that. We had somebody else who was implicated with this same fellow um, the year before, I can't remember what his sentence was, but he also, he, he mm -hmm. robbed a couple family dollar stores, actually I think on the north side, but lived mm -hmm. um, in our area, uh, or at least hung around there, and so he got a substantial sentence as well. But what I, you know, I was very concerned, and still am obviously, early on this year we had two homicides in back-to-back -back blocks, and I know that you're uh, working on that. Part of what we're trying to do is look at um, sort of the approach I think that Alderman Kennedy was talking about, and that is looking at things early on. What I see happening, and, and I talked about this, I can still remember, and I won't tell you how many years ago it was, in a basement um, of a church, and I think it was a sergeant. Um, nobody here was the leader of this sergeant, and he started talking about you know, dealing with violent crime, I think it was, and, and my impression of that is the same impression I have today, and that is that a young man doesn't one day stand up and start, you know, shooting people down with an Uzi. It's a gradual process. And so what I'm seeing, and you were talking about the lack of communication and the lack of ability to, to, um, to get along and, and reduce conflict, you know, we ha have a lot of things that we just sort of take for granted. So if there's a lot of noise, we say you gotta accept that. If there's a whole bunch of motorcycles, which I get calls about because they're racing up and down, Broadway uh, every weekend, or if um, you know we have kids out in the middle of the street, it seems reasonable that they would be playing basketball until such time as they start damaging other people's vehicles, or they um, you know get into an argument because there's a rival group that comes over, or they you know start gambling and there's a fight about that, which by the way, as we know, was on the those two blocks I was talking about. Um, just these various issues that seem to be acceptable so when people call communication they say well what do you want us to do about that and what we really want them to do about it and I know that you know your leadership here is doing it every day and the folks who stood up I have um, interacted with them over the years going through the through the Citizens uh, Police Academy and so forth and they're doing a bang-up job um, is that we really want them to recognize that these things need to be quelled very early. And it doesn't mean stormtroopers, as you well know. It means somebody going in there and being able to talk to them and, and convince them that, you know, the playground is over here or this opportunity is over there or whatever because people in the neighborhood are afraid to go out there because the next thing that happens is there's retaliation. Or people feel guilty that they're telling folks not to do this or that. So. It, it really is, as you've said, it's something that we need to, to deal with early on and also that we need to be, as a city, more focused on a lot of things. For instance, in my area, I have to be just focused on getting homeowners, homeowners who are going to be there for seven years or so rather than six months so that they take an interest in that neighborhood. It's their neighborhood. They're going to protect it and do all the things like this group I was telling you about, go to court and do all the other things. So I really don't have a question for you. I'm still struggling with you and, and you know, with you together, not uh, to um, see how the city and the police department and, and, and I and, and the community can continue to keep working on these early on. And I think perhaps one of the Achilles heels right now is the communication division in terms of understanding how to get that out to the police department. And I'm a firm believer in everything that you said, the broken windows theory. If neighborhoods show those nuisance crimes those, that the criminal element feels comfortable to operate. But I also worry, and I'm going to go back to Mission Creep a little bit. I mean, this is a real call that I've heard on the radio since I've been chief. 8.30 in the morning, a mother calls 911 and says, my 12-year-old won't get out of the car and go to school. Will you send a police officer? So where do our duties start and where our duties stop and where do parents? So, so it, it, think about it as a police officer, you know, it's, gonna, it's difficult for them. You know, we're not parents and we expect the parents to do that. But I, I agree with you on, on everything that you said. It's just where does it start and where does it stop? All right, Alderman French. Thank you. Um, first, can the officer maybe bring up that, uh, the first PowerPoint presentation that the chief was, uh, showed us before? 
Uh, second, I think it would be helpful to have these PowerPoint presentations uh, delivered to us before the meeting in the future, especially if they contain a lot of data. And they're available on our website, and we update them usually the first week of every month, but we'll make sure that they're, they're out there. They're always out there. The, this one available this, now yeah. on the website? Uh, well, this one's dated through the 22nd. The one for last month is available. This one was one that I customized a little bit for today. Normally, I wouldn't customize it. We do it once a month. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. that. Um, I appreciate that you customized it. And yeah, in the future, if we can have it before the meeting, that would be helpful. Um, so I guess the format here is we ask five minutes of questions, and then we'll come back. So I'll prioritize. I did a lot of three, so go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I'll prioritize my, my first five minutes of questions. Um, so first, you've um, repeatedly gone on television and in the media, and you've talked about how crime is down in the city. And this is something that I think has been kind of your mantra over the last three months, is that crime is down, crime is down. Um, but if you go to the slide specifically about homicides for the year, I mean, obviously violent crime is up, and not just up a little bit, up significantly. No, that's not a true statement. Violent crime by FBI UCR definition is down. And how do you define violent crime? Homicide, robbery, aggravated assault, rape. So two of the four are up. If you want to talk about individual categories, but your statement that violent crime by UCR definition is up in the city is not a true statement. Specific categories in that are. Okay, so of the four categories you just named, which ones are up and which ones are down? Uh, if you go back to the first, go back to the next, the first slide. Keep going, go back. We'll work back to it. Homicides. Up. Aggravated assaults. Up. And those are the violent crimes. Burglary, larceny, vehicle theft, arson are not included. They're included in the property category, just those first four bars. So homicides are up plus 16 compared to last year, and there are 22 more aggravated assaults through April 22nd. Okay, so of the four categories of violent crime, two are up, one significantly, and two are down. Okay, and so what I, what I want you to understand, though, is that when you live in one of those neighborhoods that are deeply affected by violent crime, uh, it is disheartening to have uh, the guy in charge of fixing the problem on television saying that it's not a problem. And it feels like when we come down to these questions about you know, violent crime in neighborhoods, uh, the default for both you and the administration is to take this numbers game approach where you argue that there's not really a problem. Um, for most folks in my neighborhood and most folks who live in the 6th District and in North Patrol, uh, it is a ridiculous statement to say that crime is down. If you go to the slide that shows North Patrol, and I understand what you're talking about, about specific crimes, and at no point am I saying that crime is not important, at no point am I saying that we're not addressing crime and not concerned about it. But I think it's important that we have a real conversation and, and notice, and if you notice, if you want to talk about North Patrol, districts five and six, 15 fewer person crimes, uh, 200 and, I can't see the number, 363 fewer property crimes, 378 fewer crimes overall. So your statement that crime is up, categories are up, specific categories, specific crimes, but overall crime is down compared to the same time last year. Except murder and shootings. And we're talking about North St. Louis, that person crime and reflects those four categories. So when you look at North St. Louis, this year through April 22nd compared to last year, April 22nd, 15 fewer person crimes. Okay, so I deal with spreadsheets all day, mm -hmm. all right? So what you're talking about there, the number uh, North Patrol, 2.8% mm -hmm. down, talking about person crimes, as negative 15. So you're talking about negative 15 total crimes, right? In the person category. In the person. Yes. Uh, so, so that includes, um, if you go back, you go back to the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, keep going back. So it includes homicides, robberies, <coughs> rapes, and aggravated assaults. Okay. So. If there's 16 more homicides, but there's 64 fewer robberies, then you're saying that's a that's a that creates your law. You're, you're because I'm talking decreased. about I'm talking about the category. You want to talk about specific crimes, I, and we've I, that's why I put this slide there so we could talk about that. 16 more homicides spread throughout the city. Yes, 22 more aggravated assaults spread among the six districts, the 318,000 people. Right, and so that's just number games, though. So you're saying that the losses, the declines in one category make up for the increases in another category. And so here's my second question. Is all crime equal? So when you go out here and say all crime is down, or crime is down, it seems to me that you're, you're equaling all crimes. So the the property theft or uh, cell phone thefts is equal 
in raw numbers uh, to a homicide or shooting. That's why in this slide it's broken out person crime, so we can look at specific person crime, which is those four you're talking about. So citywide, 36 fewer person crimes. The gold bar, property crime, which is what you're just talking about, cell phones, larcenies from vehicles, burglaries, 750, 447. And so we break it down by category. So I'm trying to be as open and as transparent as I can, show the specific categories, show the total number, show the total number by area, the total number by district. So I'm trying to be as, as open as transparent so we're not playing a numbers game. So you can see that when we look at individual crimes, I, I certainly didn't hide the 16 plus homicides compared to last year, but you want to isolate men do those. And when we talk about crime, we talk about all crime. So I target homicides, I target aggravated assaults, we start, target stolen vehicles, we to target, target burglaries. I don't have the luxury of just picking out one crime and ignoring the rest. Um, you guys use um, CompStat here, right? That's correct, yes. And this is based out of, uh, off of what they do in New York? Each city does it differently, but CompStat, by its name, Computer Statistics, was started by Bill Bratton in New York. And every Thursday morning, we sit down with the captains and look at the crime that's happened over the last seven days, or a seven day period, four week trends and year to date. So we're looking not only this high level comparison, what's happened in the last four weeks, are we moving up in a category or moving down and the specifics that have happened in the crimes over the, the seven day period. So uh, I, I took a look at some of the uh, crime, crime stat reports or crime stat reports for New York City. And one of the, the big differences I saw in how St. Louis reports it versus New York City is they specifically break out um, shooting victims and shooting incidents. And to me, it seems like that would be more of a transparent way to report this stuff um, because ultimately that's what people are really talking about when they're talking about violent crimes. The number of people are shot, the number of people are killed. Um, is there a way we can break that out in future reports? And we do that. And so we can certainly look at aggravated assaults, for example. I said not all aggravated assaults involve a firearm. We track aggravated assaults with a gun, aggravated assaults with a knife, aggravated assaults with a baseball bat or another weapon. So we can certainly break those down and look at them. But that's not publicly reported, though. It is available through our website, yes. Uh, I see aggravated assaults with gun. Is that equal to shooting victims? By UCR definition, by UCR definition, you don't have to be shot to be a victim of aggravated assault with a firearm. Okay. okay. So it's not the same data. Your time is up, I'm sorry. And we will come back as we go back through this to allow everyone to have an opportunity. So Alderman Vaccaro. A um, couple things. One, I appreciate that the people from the community came and the police officers. I don't have an issue with how things are reported, certainly would like to see how things could be resolved. The one thing I noticed when I walked into the room today is that the people from the community all sat over there and the police sat all over here. Yeah. When it would be better if we just get up, move around and sit next to each other. I think the way that we're gonna get to the resolution on, on how we stop the crime or at least slow it down is that the community members really need to know the police as well as the police know the community members. And it's not a police problem, it's not a community problem. The way I see it, it's our problem. And we have to work together. My son, in full disclosure, is a homicide detective in the city of St. Louis. And he gets discouraged a lot when he knows who the person is that shot someone but yet cannot get cooperation, whether out of fear or whatever, from the, from the neighbors. And that's what it's gonna take, whether you start a personal relationship with a police officer so you can talk to that person or the officer starts personal relationships. All this, you know, j just a real quick story. I'm in the Big Brothers program and I feel I try to do my best to mentor my little brother to the best that I can. On his lawn, one of his friends was shot and killed and died in his house. Now, eventually, some people did finally come forward from what I understand, but when I talked to his mom, they were more like, well, I just wish the police would find out who did this and we pray that this person gets caught and in my conversation, the only way anybody's gonna get caught is if people tell. I know that we're told from kids it's not gonna be tattletales or whatever, but I can tell you that until we work together as a community, I don't care how the crime's reported, 
when we choose to start coming together as a community and working with the police and on both sides, it isn't gonna matter. We'll see these numbers go down if you're not comfortable calling the police, but you're comfortable calling uh, a police officer Smith because you, you have a personal relationship. But until, again, until we get over the fear and until we start moving together, crime won't go down. It'll go down when we make it uncomfortable for the people doing the crime to do business here. In my neighborhood, it isn't murder, but it is cars that are getting broke into. And the biggest thing we have to keep educating people in our neighborhood on is don't make it easy for the criminals to operate here. Don't leave your computer in the car. Don't leave coins in your ashtray because they will break in your car. And this stuff will stop when the people in my neighborhood quit leaving because they're going to go somewhere else when it becomes we're going to break in a car and we don't get anything from breaking in that car. But until we come together as a community, these numbers will never go down. They'll go down the minute that, as a community and as a police department, we work together, and, that, and, and that's really all I have to say. But I, you know, I just noticed that when we're in here, I'm looking at you. Anyway, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Madam? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Alderman, I didn't see Village uh, Young get up. You're welcome. Chief, I want to appreciate everybody coming down here and listening to this. I, you know, I think the big concern is that people feel like they're hiding stats. So it would probably be easier, every, you know, we had 16 more homicides this year than, you know, we had last year, but overall crime is down. It is, but it isn't, so it is kind of deceptive for a lot of people. I mean, I understand that. I mean, a lot of crimes don't get solved because you can't get the community to come together. Uh, I think a lot of it's retaliation, uh, everything else. So, I mean, it takes the community to step up and band together, and I think once you do and show you're, you're not scared, start seeing some convictions. And I agree, the courts need to be a little tougher on a lot of things. I, I'm a little disappointed in the circuit attorney in a lot of cases. But until you make that first step and quit being scared and show and the person gets the time they deserve, you know, word to start getting out. Hey, you know what? People are coming up testifying now. Maybe we need to move somewhere else. And But it takes everybody to work together. I've had a few homicides in my area which is kind of shocking given the age group of the residents in my area. And a couple of them were drug related. Um, so, I mean, it's gonna happen everywhere. We have a lot of resources. So what I'm hearing here in general is, obviously we have enough police officers on the street because we're doing this and this and that. And what I don't, I mean, what I don't understand a lot of times is why you should promote and put things on, out on TV where you're going to be and what you're going to be doing. To me, I, I wouldn't do that, but that's just me, and I'm not a policeman. That's why, you know, I, I have to go by what you say. Uh, give an example, Major Layshock, he's a legend in his own time. But anyway, I, I know they're doing the undercover down South Broadway with the prostitutes. I pulled up Bell Reef Park yesterday, emptied the trash out of my trunk because I want to put it in Mr. Villa's water instead of mine. <laughs> but there's three undercover cars, one of the white SUVs and a sergeant there. I mean, I think that's overkill on prostitutes on Broadway. And I think we could be concentrating a lot of officers somewhere else. I know there's a lot of drugs down in that area and crack houses too. But I think it's overkill and, you know, until... The residents realize police can lock prostitutes up every day. The problem is the city courts, as you well know, the judges let them out and give them a new date and they're back down there. So it's, it's a revolving door there and it's, and it's a waste of time a lot of time. So until some things change in city courts where they can do something, you know, I, I think police waste a lot of time and resources just strictly concentrating on prostitutes. Uh, we have a lot more issues in the city of St. Louis, and I'm not saying they should be out there either, but I think sometimes you can overkill on how many people you have working the case. Um, 
I think we've gotten, we seem we've gotten away from the days where we don't have summer programs for kids uh, at the schools anymore. I think that hurts, and a lot of kids don't have no direction to go, so guess what? If they can make a quick 200 or $300 selling something, they're going to choose that road. Uh, and, and it's about, we need to get programs together. I don't think it's the police officer's job to go get a call, make that kid get out of the car and go to school. That's with the parents. A lot of things are with the parents. And, and it's, a lot of people don't want to face that, let's be honest. I grew up in poverty, poverty when I was a kid. I grew up in the patch in South St. Louis. I mean, it's all whites, blacks, Spanish people, Mexicans. But a, a different era, and we had things to do in the summertime. But, I mean, that didn't mean we went out just to get in trouble, to be getting in trouble or, or try to affiliate with people running around that we knew we'd get in trouble with. So I think, you know, a lot of parents don't even know what their kids are doing because they are working two and three jobs, and being a single parent is probably the hardest thing to do. I mean, that's just some of my thoughts. I mean, I can come back later. I think overall, another thing the police been uh, in the paper a couple times responded to a 911 call. And I think the gentleman, the gentleman was actually, he had a mental illness and police were accused of, of beating him and doing this, that, and everything else where, I didn't see the whole video. I gotta see the whole thing from start, but I'm sure our duty when they call 911, my cousin's out of control, he's doing this, that. Do they tell you on that call that he has a mental issue before you get there, maybe you know how to approach it better? I think there's a lot of miscommunication there. I think the alderman talked about the, the young man in the basement a few years back or whatever. He was, well, he, he was mentally ill, and, and was it, that was a different one. Anyway, make a long story short, a lot of them kids, young kids are strong as a bull. And I mean, he's fighting them off, and that's probably just his reaction because he doesn't know any better. So I guess my question is, when you get those kind of calls, do they tell you when they call they have a mental problem, or you know, so you would know how to approach it better? Because if you come in and someone's fighting you off, well, your natural reaction is going to be you subdue the best, best and quickest way you can. So I think it's kind of unfair on both sides. So to, to kind of start, and I'll work backwards really quickly, about 50% of the people in the workhouse and in the Justice Center across the street have been diagnosed with some level of mental illness. That kind of gives you the scope of the problem that law enforcement officers deal with. What we do in the city, along with St. Louis County, is that we send our officers through a crisis intervention team training. It's a 40-hour block. In no way does it make the police officers a clinical practitioner. What it does is give them some tools. And if you can imagine, if 50% of the people that are incarcerated right now have some level of mental illness, officers encountered on a daily basis. They do a very good job. The specific incident you were talking about, they're extenuating circumstances, which I, I don't want to, to talk about, but it's under investigation right now. From a training perspective, is there something that we could do better in our training? From an internal affairs perspective, is, is there something that the officers did wrong? But really from a response, and I've sat down with uh, people from the mental health community to talk about what can we do better as a community to respond to situations like that. So I think we'll get some positive outcomes that, that come from that. Working backwards, the, the prostitution issue. Uh, policing isn't a zero-sum game. And so prostitution leads to other crimes. You talked about the larcenies uh, being a, your problem. Certainly we know if, if, going back to the broken windows theory that we talked about, if we allow that type of behavior, you talked about drugs. So now you've got prostitution and drugs. So now you've got prostitution, drugs, and larcenies. So those crimes build together. It's not a zero-sum game. That's why we target those crimes. Not with the same focus that we do violence crimes, but we do focus those because we do know they're precursors to other inc in incidents. And your last point, uh, I think jobs are absolutely key on every level. And I know the mayor is working to put almost double the number of summer jobs in place this year that they had previous years. But again, like everything else, it becomes a funding priority. Thank you, Alderman Arnowitz. Alderman Hubbard. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and everyone who's kind to just offer us some type of understanding and support of what we have going on here. Um, I know you all spoke to the demographics of the community and the social ills that are affecting the community, and 
I clearly understand, and I'm pretty sure all of my colleagues understand that. And you all talked about some of the solutions and some of the things that you're doing, you know, with the outreach to families and the violent response team and ju the du juvenile division back in the schools. And all of that stuff is fine and well, but when you talk to the community, you know, I can't tell. When they're concerned about crime, I can't say, oh, well, we have this program over here, we have that program over there. They're looking for something certain. They're looking for something swift. They're, they're in a position in their life where they don't want to have to take their kid out their neighborhood just to do something as simple as ride a bike. It's that bad in my community, in my neighborhood, and these are the things that I'm faced with every day. I live in the car square neighborhood. I don't stay on some private street, so, you know, it's, it's kind of sad when you see a bunch of guys congregating, they're selling drugs, they're doing this, they're doing that, and you call the police and the police come out and they don't even get out the car. That, that's a sad state that we're in, you know. I don't want to pretend that I'm an expert on crime, but as a citizen and clearly someone that's in a leadership position and people are leaning on me for understanding, we just have to do a better job at making our community safer because you know, there, there's a lot going on, and no one should have to live in their home and, you know, be concerned about staying away from windows and stuff like that. So I just think as a, as a community, as a police department, we all just need to, you know, get our hands on deck and try, try to do a better job. Um, in my neighborhood, we've given our watch commander access via watchtower to our passcode so they can see, you know, what's going on, so they can, you know, be more proactive and reactive in certain sense to, to deal with this situation on crime. But my greatest fear is that this summer is going to be devastating. And it's, it's personal to me because I live there, and I definitely don't want anyone in my family or any, any one of my constituents to lose their life because everybody's not doing their job. So, you know, I take it kind of personal because it's rough, and I'm just, you know, I'm counting on you all. You know, they're counting on me, so we all need to do whatever we can do to address this crime problem in our city because it's totally out of control, totally. And I'll take your two, your two points if I heard them right. We have expectations of our police officers. If you, a police officer doesn't ever meet your expectations, certainly call, you've got a great relationship, you talked about the watch commander, certainly do that. The second piece is I'm telling you that when we arrest the 27 to 30,000 people, the outcomes that the courts give them do not keep the people of the city of St. Louis safe and keep those people from reoffending. So. We can arrest people, but when we arrest the same people multiple times, and we do, somebody else has to step in. That's not an enforcement. We had Rick Rosenfeld in the University of Missouri, St. Louis, look at the activities that had the biggest impact on crime. Car stops had a big impact on robbery. We know that. Arrests had the smallest incremental impact on crime because there's so many people come back out and reoffend. So arresting our way out of this, and, and that's what the police do. We arrest people. We, I'm telling you, arresting people isn't getting you the outcomes that you want. We need to do other things. Thanks. Um, I have a long list of questions. I got like four papers scattered around, so I'm going to start with the first one that I see. Um, what are the rates of uh, solved homicides? How many solved homicides have we have? I mean, uh, have have we solved? Um, and how many solved crimes have we um, have we solved? Uh, John Green, what's the current? Clearance rate on homicides. Uh, okay. Uh, in, uh, for January to now, so about half, forty-seven point five. Yeah, less than half. Oh, okay. And, but, and just, just on that, and, and maybe I'll take give me a minute back of his time, just so I can address an issue here. A lot of those cases we've arrested, and we've taken to the circuit attorney's office, and because we don't have witness cooperation, those cases don't get issued. Those individuals that we believe responsible for the homicides are still walking on the streets. That's really the, the, an unfortunate thing, but it's a reality. And so we have, you can have a couple seconds back. I'm sorry. Right. You know, and, and I asked that question for, uh, for a few reasons, because um, there have been a few times uh, recently where there were homicides uh, that happened in my ward, and uh, the, the victims of family um, they had to contact me to get in touch with the detective, or they had to contact me to get in touch uh, with uh, Major Robinson to see if we can, you know, get some type of answer or to possibly 
uh, and get them to pass pertinent uh, information that may uh, solve the case. And so, you know, I, I don't know if, if there is a disconnect between, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the victim's families um, and, and you all, but it seemed to be at a point. Um, and uh, let, let, let me just say this too. So I, I live in a, in a part of town where my world, um, you, we butt up against uh, Jennings and St. Louis County. And uh, I just want to paint a picture for you really quick. So if you stand at the border of my world, and I stand there all the time, on um, Goodfellow and West Florissant, you can see people driving doing 25, 30, straight through Jennings. As soon as they hit the city limits, trash comes out the window, and they, they, do, they do 50 automatically. And so I, I, I just wanted to ask you, what, 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 what do you think that they are doing differently than that, that we aren't in the city for folks to have that type of, uh, of uh, mentality that as soon as they hit the city limits, ah, oh, yeah, it's on, we, you know, we, it, 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 nothing's going to happen. So that, I, and I think that's to that. the point about the outcomes, that they know that the 22nd Judicial Circuit is different than the circuit in the county, and that when we arrest people, and even for city ordinance violations, it, which typically is a fine, they're not afraid of that. So they know that the city circuit is liberal in comparison to the rest of the state, and that the outcomes are going to be such that don't impact their lives significantly. All right. Now, I, um, you know, I always work, I work with you guys. I mean, we have a, a great neighborhood uh, liaison officer. Have a great problem uh, property officer. The neighborhood ownership model uh, is thriving in my ward. Um, but at the same time, they all have let me know that they are far stretched. Um, and, and and I wanted to ask you, what what did you, well, what do you think now of the redistricting plan? Is it working? Because in a sense. Um, as I talk to, to your average um, officer on the street, uh, they are saying something else. Uh, you know, case in point, um, I had a shooting on um, great yesterday, or the day before yesterday. Um, several people called the police. Um, it took more than an hour of, for, for them to get out. It, 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 and actually, um, it, 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 it was a specialty call that was made to get folks out. And so when the officer came, they stayed in the car, and I think <laughs> some of my constituents jumped in the car, like, get out of the car, you know, they, they, uh, they were just shooting. And uh, when the guy got out, you know, they asked him, you know, what took so long? He was just like, man, I was just on another, um, you know, uh, shooting down in College Hill, and we were stretched, we don't have that many officers. So I'm asking you, I mean, the 6th District was already one of the worst districts uh, in the city, and then we added uh, a few of our um, not so nice neighborhoods and um, just a, a, a few officers. Um, what, what are we doing to guarantee that the officers on, on the street have as many resources and um, guns that more, more than the criminal? Because, I mean, these criminals are, are riding around um, with, with some high power stuff, and I know that the police can't handle what a majority of these people are, are riding around with. So, you know, what's your plan to offer more resources to your average officer? Uh, you made a whole bunch of generalizations. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and so the, the redistricting, we looked at the response time for the last week, and I've looked at it every time. So let's talk about redistricting first. We'll make an assessment about redistricting after the busy season, after the summer. I, it's, it's the winter, the spring is not a good time to make the adjustment. We look at response times. There is less than one second difference between the six district configuration of all responses compared to the nine district. So less than one second. So it, we, if you were, we were on break and knew that it took the officers an hour to respond because a shooting is a priority one call for us that we go lights and sirens for. Right, no, and, no, I was, I was not, but they said that uh, that uh, the officers talked about, well, when you call, you have to say, because um, they were just saying uh, shots fired, you know, but they didn't say something uh, correct. And I'm not even sure what they didn't say, right? But oh, so it's kind of hard to, to, to debunk something when you don't have information, and I don't, you don't have complete information, and I don't have any information. So, so that's a challenge. The, the next question about giving the officers the resources, I just disbanded the department's um, a couple of administrative units 
to put officers back out on the street for the summer to make sure that we put the resources out there. We've got an academy class that we started, and my commitment is to run an academy class to keep us as close to our staffing number as we can. Because what's happened previously is that our staffing numbers have fluctuated greatly because of the way we've put academy classes through. My commitment is to try and stay as close to the authorized strength numbers that we have. And then we are evaluating the officer's duty weapon. We've put assault rifles, and we've trained a, a number of sergeants to put assault rifles. We've sent the department through active shooter training. We've done a variety of things to get them better prepared, and we're going to continue to do that. Colonel Michelle, along with our training division, is going to introduce uh, a training supervisor in each of the areas that will do daily and weekly training for those officers about felony car stops, how to be safe, how to approach those individuals. So we're doing a lot of things to try and, and bring up the standards, bring up the training of our officers. Okay, another, um, do I have more time? Okay, yeah. yeah. So um, Alderman Bosley touched on something. He said that, uh, and, and, and he is 100% correct uh, when he said that people give um, us, um, Alderman, um, a lot of information and, uh, you know, most of the time we try to give them to, um, uh, to you guys to see something done. And I've done that extensively on many occasions and nothing ever gets done. The only time that something gets done is when I have to call Major Robinson. And I hate calling him. Um, but, you know, and, and, and I don't think that I should have to call somebody higher up like Major Robinson to get something done. I, I, I take my average citizen, uh, and I'm just throwing a name out there, Mrs. Johnson. She can't get access to, to Major Robinson to, uh, you know, to give away that information. Um, so, you know, nothing ever gets done uh, just in terms of, 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 of getting the right people locked up. I mean, it, there, there have been times where I have uh, specifically given um, people to work with um, different officers, and they've given pertinent information, detailed, um, what different drug spots were, who was getting it, the, the, the daily routine, and, the, and those folks, I still see them now, or today. It's been happening for a whole year since I've been on it, since I was just last uh, elected. So how, how can we close the gap and start locking some of these people up? Well, and, and two things. One, so we never have this conversation again. I want you to call Ronnie Robinson or your Captain Ed Kuntz. Those are the people that I hold responsible. So how information is passed to individual officers is, is always concerning to me, but there are 800 uniformed officers in the patrol division. I can't know what each one of them knows right. at any given time. So your points of contact are the major and the captain of your district, and that way we don't have this conversation again. Okay. The other piece is, is those individuals that you're talking about, because I don't know who they are, we can't look to see if they've been arrested. We can't see look if they're out on bail, if they're out on bond, if their case has been adjudicated in a way that keeps them as a problem. So those are the, the pieces that are always hard in this context. Hey, I want to know everything that your, your community is willing to share with us because it makes us better as a neighborhood, as a community. Right. And that way we can act upon it. And you should never feel, if you can't get Ronnie, you can't get the captain, call me. That's really how committed we are about this. Right. Um, okay, your time is up. Um, Alderman Bosley, we're going to go back through. You have three minutes, but we're going to end this at 12 o'clock because if you look around here, this is a very expensive meeting. Um, and I don't think our citizens would want to know that the police department and the, pol the politicians were keeping our officers <laughs> off the street. So we'll end at 12. Wait, Madam Chair, Bosley, but do you have, Madam Chair are you, you have saying that we minutes. only have eight minutes of questions total? That's correct, Alderman. And that's, that's accountability? This is the first time we've seen the police chief since January. Alderman, we're going to have eight minutes, and that's the way this meeting is going to go. Madam Chairwoman, are you going Alderman to Alderman Bosley, it's your turn. Are you going to allow people not on the committee to ask it? No, I'm not. <laughs> Alderman Bosley, you have three minutes. I don't have any more questions. Thank you. Alderman Kennedy has uh, gone. He's trying to schedule the Ways and Means hearings. Alderman Schmidt. All right. Alderman Boyd, do you have any questions? Not at this time. Alderman French, three minutes. Um, so I have more than three minutes of questions. I understand that you do, but I think conversations can occur with the chief in other times. So if you take your three minutes now. Listen, we, we now have local control of the police department. The responsibility of this public safety committee is the same as was with the police commissioners. 
Uh, our job is to maintain accountability for the board and to be serious about crime and, and public safety in the city. Uh, I don't think we've met that responsibility. We haven't had the chief in here often. We, he's rarely here. Uh, and that you would limit aldermen and members of this committee to just five minutes of questions is ridiculous. Now, I don't know if you're here to protect the administration or you're here to protect the public, but I have questions, lots of questions, and I have not been able to get answers from the chief. This is my opportunity as a member of this committee, and I think we should be allowed to ask as many questions and as many to go as long as it needs to. We're not limited to an hour. Your three minutes started at 11.37. Now 11.38, you have two more minutes. Will the community be able to ask questions? The community has opportunities to ask questions at neighborhood meetings where the police are represented. If you don't like it, I'm going to ask the marshals to clear the room. Are you you have all, all, all the people to I don't now. understand, Phyllis, why you don't let or other, all minutes. the people who showed up here to ask questions. I have never, in all the years I served on the board, been a, denied access as a member of the Board of Aldermen to ask questions. And you're not doing yourself any good to do this. You need to back down off of that position because it is an irresponsible position. You may made it so that I'm not a senior alder person, but I still have 13 years at this Board of Aldermen. And I I have never been denied access to ask questions. And I will never have the chief at any of my meetings if you do not let me and these people here ask any meetings. You're telling her she's doing the wrong thing now. You do not do, you don't hold meetings like this. Are you this listening is, to the older one for the first? Uh, no, I'm going to ask the question. As many as I can, please shut me off. So, picking up where we left off last time, the new 6th district. Um, when you first did redistricting, you said that um, you were taking special efforts to balance cost of service. Okay? Crime and officers. All right. So a district like the second district, which has its set of crime uh, and types of crime, has equal officer and resources to a district like the sixth district, which has, I think by some counts I've heard, now 40% of the violent crime in the city. Uh, and the sixth district does not have 40% of the violent crime in the city. And the variable is geography. So the second district grew in size, so it covers a larger area. The sixth district may have grew, grow, grown slightly to include some of the areas of the old fifth district, but didn't grow like the second district did. So balanced calls for service, balanced crime, balanced number of officers, the variable was geography. But in that equation, what you're doing again is making all crime equal. So if there are lots of calls for service for, say, uh, loud music or car break-ins that's equal in, in your math to uh, you know, 20 calls of service for shootings or homicides or stabbings. Is that correct? And if you look, we balanced it so the officers have the same workload. And so you're trying to differentiate. When an officer is on a call, whether it's for a larceny from a vehicle or a shooting, they're still out of service. And so you're trying to, to create a, a perception that the officer could be doing something else if they were doing this. They're still out of service. They're still handling a call from a citizen. They're still doing that interaction. So you're, you're trying to, to create something that, that you're spinning it a little bit. No, my, my question is this. Is if, uh, do you think the areas with more violent crime need more police resources? And that's what we do with hotspot policing. Each captain has a cadre of officers, so we've balanced the officers on the workload, we've given them resources on top of that, and then you heard from Major Rayshock and Major Robinson that their focus is violent crime, and so to follow yours, which you're, you're, you're wrong, that, but if you say 40% of the violence is in the 6th District, they follow where the violence is, so you're getting resources from other parts of the city when those districts are rough to deal with that crime with the resources in their district when there's a hot spot. Over, when we're not hot spot, if we were in Telegraph South last week, we're going to be in Wells Goodfellow in two weeks. In that week between, they're going to where the problems are. Just this morning in Comstat, we talked about um, um, aggravated assaults, drive-by shootings. We're targeting those and working in the, in the neighborhoods now that have issues like that. So just as I said, uh, prostitution isn't a zero-sum game. Hotspot policing isn't a zero-sum game. We don't ignore the rest of the city. Somebody mentioned about saying that we're going into Wells Goodfellow. We've been in the Wells Goodfellow. We've been doing things in the Wells Goodfellow. We're just announcing it now. So it's not a zero-sum game. So what constitutes a hot spot? Uh, I look at the neighborhood crime stats, and there are many neighborhoods that have more violent crime and more crime than Tower Grove South. How was Tower Grove South selected as the first hot spot of the year? 
But when we look at it, just like College Hill was, we saw patterns and trends there that were concerning to us, and we thought we could have an impact. So College Hill was the first neighborhood we had an impact. We've been to Fountain Park, Lewis Place, uh, Tower Grove South, Wells Good Fellow next. So it's a trend, and we see that the resources in that area are probably addressing it as well as they can. We could do a little bit of a better job. That's when we put the resources in. So as you put these things weeks in advance, though, so you, we, you now advertise that on May 2nd or May 7th or whatever you're going over into uh, Will's Goodfellow. Uh, how do you know that's the priority three weeks from now? What we do is, we, as I talked about concept, we not only look at the one week, we look at the four week, we look at the year to date. We know that May 1st, May 2nd, May 3rd, May 4th, those days are problems for the 5100 blocks, the 5200 blocks, the 5300 blocks. So we're going to go into those areas beforehand. And I have no problem talking about where we're going because we're open and transparent. And if the criminals listen to TV the way you and I do, and they hear we're going to be in Wells Goodfellow, and I said that we're already there, hopefully that helps deter crime too. I'm willing to try anything that we think can have an impact. Real social media, like you use it, I use it, everybody uses social media because it does have an impact. Uh, the neighborhood ownership model is something that was brought up, you, you often tout it as uh, a way the community can step up. Mm -hmm. So um, we have been, we have embraced the neighborhood ownership model in our community, but we haven't gotten the resources that other neighborhoods get. An example, uh, Lafayette Square neighborhood uh, was where neighborhood ownership model started. They have a neighborhood officer. Lafayette Square has a population of about 2,078 people. Over in North St. Louis, in my neighborhood, you stretched our neighborhood officer over three neighborhoods, totaling a population of 19,000 people. So how can one neighborhood officer serve three neighborhoods in North St. Louis, but in South St. Louis and Lafayette Square neighborhood, they get one officer for 2,000 people? Well, that's actually, and your information's wrong again, it's Lafayette Square and the Seward neighborhood share an officer. And you kind of talked about the rarity of our conversations. I've been here twice, and it's April. So that's every other month. And just a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, you and I sat down in my office for an hour, and we talked about it, and you didn't raise that issue once. You didn't bring up the neighborhood ownership model in that. We talked about Fallon Park. We talked about Fairground Park. We talked about a variety of things, but you didn't ask for another neighborhood ownership model. Oh, officer. Can you give that to you? Okay. Um, only your email. time is up. Wait, but he, he brought up a point. This is an email uh, dated April, I'm sorry, June 4th, 2013, <laughs> sent to you last year and the captain at the time detailing specifically what I just said. It was then followed up by another email from Alderwoman Flowers saying she also had grave concerns about how you stretched the neighborhood officer for Baden, Old Fallon, and Penrose, and nothing's been done in almost a year. And as I said, that we are working on the neighborhood ownership model and we are using the resources that we have. And so if you had an issue, and this is almost a year old, yeah. we agree with that. We were together two weeks ago. It didn't come up in conversation. So you had an opportunity to bring it up and say it hasn't been addressed yet. Well, we keep meeting in these, up in these situations where apparently I have limited time. <laughs> <laughs> how, many times have you, how many times have you texted me and asked me a question? Have you texted me and asked me a question? Gentlemen, I think that you're getting into some personal things here, and we're going to move on. Alderman Picaro, do you have three minutes? Just quickly, we also just have one liaison officer for Linwood, Tilly's, South, Sohan, and North Kings Highway, Ben Stalin. But, again, we go back to where the neighborhood's working together. We went to the last three trials that we came and did witness statements at, same guys that were getting out with sentences, but then they suspend them and let them right back out. All three cases, and I didn't make the last one Monday, just the neighbors went there, all three cases resulted in long sentences. John Reininger was 25 years uh, with no possibility for parole for, I think, like 19 years. But anyway, in all three cases, we went as a community and said, we, we, we're not going to tolerate these guys coming out. What I keep hearing is, is the police are arresting a lot of people. They don't necessarily end up in jail. I can tell you in our community, it's pretty much known. And I'm telling you, we will go. We do go. We will go. The ownership program, even though we only have the one liaison, liaison officer for a large area, it's exactly that. It's ownership. All that guy does, he comes in, he reports crime. He sends us a weekly crime report that we send out to the neighborhood. I get it. I make sure my residents get it. 
So we're aware of the crime in the neighborhood, but in our in our area, in our group, I can tell you the people have taken ownership. They show up at court, and we've the last three trials ended up in long convictions. Fifteen years on the one that was Monday. Um, so I'm I'm just trying to get across the point. All, only way this is going to work is working together. We can argue all day, but until we come together, as this is our city, and until we come together and run these rats out of the city, it's not going to change. We can argue how the stuff's reported. We can argue that one area is getting preferenced over another, but it's our neighborhood, our city, and if we work together and we take ownership, it, it'll make a difference. Alderman Arnowitz. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Chief, I'll just be very brief. Going back to your statement, um, I know it's a zero tolerance on prostitution. I didn't say we shouldn't arrest them and do things down there. That wasn't my point. I just think for that area down there that runs from, uh, let's say, uh, Broadway 55 south to the South Public Market, that's the trouble areas right there in Pennsylvania. I just think <clears throat> a little overkill. I mean, you can clean it all up with everybody. A month from now, they're going to be back out there. So do you pull all your 10 officers back in to do that besides other things? And I understand. I, we don't have a vice squad anymore. Okay. Uh, vice used to do it all the time. I, I think they, there was maybe six people. I used to watch them work. Um, the other thing is, too, I, I think the worst thing the previous chief ever did was dismantle mobile reserve. They used, to, they used to be in the hot neighborhoods looking for the drugs, the gun dealers, and everything else. So, to me, that's part of the problem when we dismantle mobile reserve. Now, here, the mobile reserve is, is coming back, which is good. Um, I'm hearing complaints because maybe we're concentrating everywhere else on things. I've heard of my last couple of neighborhood meetings are on the, the neighborhood computer site. They see less and less police officers riding through our area now. And I mean, I just hear about, and they want to know where they're at at nighttime because of the drag racing on Hampton and, and Graboys at nighttime, this, that, and everything else. Which, we're going to hear that everywhere. Everybody drag racing, everybody speeds, I understand that. But that's just some of the concerns that I'm hearing down there. Um, I don't know if the problem is, and, and you know, this goes back, and, and I will agree in looking at the thing, I think police officers are really stretched thin on the north end. I, I mean, I really do. Um, I know response time probably isn't as quick right now and everywhere because of it, because there is a lot of things going on. Uh, I think when a police officer is at Bluff Grown Grabwise and gets a call for a fight at Minnesota and Dakota, that's a pretty good little run from there. So, you know, the fight's over by then and everything else. So, I mean, I understand we have problems and, and everybody's taking the initiative to address it, and I appreciate it. that's what we can do. My last comment would be, uh, you know, the city workhouse, city jails full, and we do have a lot of people there with mental diseases and illnesses. You know, they don't belong there. We need, we need, we need to be as leaders to find money to put them somewhere else to get the proper care. Um, and it's unfortunate because they don't understand when they're in trouble and everything else. And it's unfortunate on both sides, even on the police officer's side. So we have a lot of work to do in the city. And I, and I think the deception among a lot of the aldermen here, and I, I'm not trying to speak for everybody, we would like to be more informed when things are going on, talks in the city between room 200 the police chief, and the commanders. I think all we're asking is just a little courtesy of what's going on. Because we don't find out about a lot of things till after it's in the paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and, uh, and I thought that was part of city control. And I'll be honest with you, I was never in favor of it because who here in City Hall knows how to run a police department? I, I'll be honest with you. It's, not, it's not my job, but, you know, it's just my opinion. So I think we all just need to get work a little bit better together, and I think we can all do this together as time goes on. Thank you, Alderman Arnimitz. Alderman Hubbard? I'd just like to um, 
thank the chief and members of the police department for coming and offering a little understanding about some of the issues that we are facing. And I will say this, um, I understand that, you know, some people have agendas and some people want to badger certain people, but that's not how we get things accomplished. That's not how we deal with the crisis that this city is facing. And I will also say that never before have I sat in a meeting where all, all the persons were able to ask questions. And I think that's something we need to work on. You know, with all due respect, Madam Chairman, I feel that, you know, we are passionate about this because these are the type of things that are going on in our communities and everyone needs to have, a, have the opportunity to speak and express their concerns. But in doing it, let's do it where it's result driven. Let's not badger somebody because of our own personal views or whatever, but I believe people do deserve the opportunity to speak. Alderman Carter. Thanks. Um, I think you, uh, you are, well, with your uh, conversation with Alderman Kennedy, I think you talked about um, a generational change. Um, and you mentioned different programs and things um, that you would like to see happen, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, you know, you and I, we've, we've always talked about the asset of forfeiture fund, and I know you're probably getting tired of me uh, I'm bringing this up. But uh, with that fund, you can create different types of programming, right? Crime prevention programming, right? Within some constraints, but yes. I know some rules, but yes. So where I'm from, we like to say, put your money where your mouth is. And so I would love to see a portion of that money um, come back to our community um, or to different wards um, in terms of programming to slow some of these uh, crimes down. Um, I think that that is key, and I think that uh, it will be a good look from, uh, from you all, the police department, and it shows that you are really uh, um, are dedicated to change uh, uh, most of these uh, situations. So what do you think about that? Absolutely. I think it's certainly a conversation, and I think a, a percentage of that money should be reinvested back in, because if we do do that, then our jobs get easier, and that's ultimately what we're trying to do. So, right. But it has to be something measurable, right. it has to be something impactful, and it has to be outcome driven. Can I get a, uh, a dollar amount from you now? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I'd ask. Just thought I'd ask. Um, and in terms of hot spot uh, of policing, I walked out of the room for, for a quick second to uh, grab my lunch, so I'm not sure uh, what was discussed. Uh, but uh, I have read that hot spot policing seems to be a temporary fix uh, in, a, in the bigger scheme of things. What are your thoughts on that? Um, the, the areas um, after you get done hot spotting them or, uh, or you know, um, doing your thing in them? Do, uh, does it get worse? Is it equal or, uh, you know, or is it better? And this is where we've turned to the University of Missouri, Rick Rosenfeld and UMSL, to help validate what we've done. And what we've seen is, is that, and hotspot policing is not new, we've just really put on a name and a face on it, that their research, research, research shows that when you put police officers into the areas that are experiencing the problem, you do have an impact. And what we've seen then in the College Hill neighborhood, even at the end of last year, we were there in January and February, the residual effect lasted throughout the year. UMSO continues to study this, and we're continuing to look at it. I've constantly said that hotspot policing is not a program. It's the way I want to do business every day. And if you think about it, logically, it, it makes sense that you commit the resources to the areas that are experiencing the problem. And the problems in, in your ward will be different than, than the problems in, in um, Jovacar or, or Arnowitz's ward. And that's why we address them differently. Our strategies for violence are different than our strategies for larcenies from vehicles. I, don't, I get paged. I know every time that somebody is involved in an aggravated assault in the city of St. Louis. I didn't want those pages to stop. I get paged in the middle of the night when it happens because I want to know and I want to make sure that when I wake up in the morning that we're doing everything we can to keep that from happening again to somebody else. Okay. Um, I have one more question. Um, I'm ready to go. Okay, so um, I think someone, I'm, I'm not sure if it was you or if it was Major Robinson that talked about uh, rebranding the, uh, the department. Because right now, I, I, I know for a fact that people in my community, they have lost hope in the police department, period. Um, so how, how do you plan to rebuild um, uh, the brand uh, when you have uh, certain things like like, like the incident that happened with the mentally uh, challenged man, the incident that happened with the uh, young African-American man who was set up. Um, 
uh, what, what, what's your plan now in terms of rebuilding? And this is where I actually need everybody's help. Oh, rebranding. I'm not, not only yours, but, but everyone in the community. As I said about some other question, I have expectations of the police officers that they do their jobs correctly. They do it ethically, they do it morally, they do it to the best of their ability. What I don't want to do is armchair quarterback, and, and that's why we're looking into the issue. On the surface, it may appear to be something the officers may have encountered something along the way. So I never want to put armchair quarterback and then the quarterback in the public with them. We do critical incident reviews. But to get out to the public, when I came to the Board of Aldermen the first time, I said there were three priorities I had. Reducing crime, dealing with the perception of crime, and communication. And that communication piece is internally and externally. I think if people believe in their police department, that if they see their police department as transparent, then they're opt to trust them. What is working against us is this pop culture belief that snitching is bad, that retaliation happens. Because what happens is when, when it does, and it's seldom, but when it does, it becomes folklore and it becomes that. So we need to support the victims that we have. I and mean, the homicide victim is the example that I gave you, the, the, the witnesses. They're afraid to come forward because they were afraid of retaliation. That's not a police department issue. That's our community's issue. And right, I right, 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 right. And I'm meaning to cut you off, but I think that it is a police department issue when you have um, times where uh, seniors or residents may call the police and they go straight to the door. I think that somebody else mentioned that too, where they go directly to the door and say, who, okay, and point the person out. Who, who was it? That's a good and thing. that's the issue. Because that road sp spreads quicker than any other. If you walk into North Patrol today, you will see a campaign that we're doing to try and protect the callers. As soon as you walk in the door, it says, and, and I'm paraphrasing, but protect our best asset. Protect the people that call 911. Right. In the roll call room, there's a reminder. So I'm doing an educational piece inside the police department to try and do that. And so when somebody calls 911, the, the, the evaluator say, do you want to be contacted? You can certainly say no, or the better answer is yes, but only by cell phone or only by phone. Because a lot of times when we go to a, a, a call, we don't have information. So I'm working on the officer's side to make sure that we don't go to somebody's door that doesn't want us. But I also need the community to be able to work with us and give us additional information. So that's just one example internally how I'm trying to change the message and change the culture. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your questions? time this morning. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation, and we will be doing this in the future as well. Could you, the meantime, Chief State, I would answer encourage questions from the constituents that showed up to ask me. And I would also add, I, I would, would like encourage to you questions. to talk to the Chief during this interim period. You have his cell phone, you have his email address, and he is at a number of meetings in your districts or in your ward. I would encourage you to communicate with him. In the meantime, we will be talking here about how to influence that in the future as well. This is not a public hearing for the residents to speak. You have neighborhood meetings, you have district meetings in your area. So this is not the forum for that. Thank you for your time, and we will see you probably in a month. Is this, is this committee continuing, or is it if, this if in? This meeting is adjourned. Okay.